Welcome back to Unveiling the Dark Side. In today's video, we are going to be diving into the second layer of the unsolved serial killers and mass murders iceberg. This is the second part of this iceberg, so if you haven't seen that, make sure you check it out first. The reason that I'm doing this in multiple parts is because I like to give as much information as I can as well as it still being a short enough video that you can consume it. And if I did all of these layers together, it would be a couple of hours long. So, with that, we will get right into it. But before we do that, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that bell to know when the next video comes out. It really helps to get more people to be able to see the video now to the second layer. Before we dive deep, a little reminder for what an iceberg is. An iceberg is a multi-layer video where the tip is common knowledge and the deeper we go down the iceberg or the less known information will be. Hopefully that explains it quick and well enough for everyone now. Let's dive into it. Chicago Tylenol Murders the Chicago Tylenol murders were a series of poisoning deaths resulting from drug tampering in the Chicago metropolitan area. In 1982, the victims consumed Tylenol-branded acetaminophen capsules that had been laced with potassium cyanide. Seven people died in the original poisonings, and there were several more deaths in subsequent copycat crimes. No suspect has been charged or convicted of the poisonings, but New York City resident James William Lewis was convicted of extortion for sending a letter to Tylenol's manufacturer. Johnson & Johnson, that took responsibility for the deaths and demanded $1 million to stop them. The incidents led to reforms in the packaging of over-the-counter drugs and to federal anti-tampering laws. On September 28, 1982, 12-year-old Mary Kellerman was hospitalized after consuming a capsule of extra-strength Tylenol. She died the next day. On September 29th, six other individuals consumed contaminated Tylenol including Adam Janus, 27, Stanley Janus, 25, and Teresa Janus, 20, who each took Tylenol from a single bottle. All six, the Januses, Mary McFarland, 31, Paula Prince, 35, and Mary Reiner, 27, would ultimately die from the consumption. Asked to investigate the Janus's deaths, nurse Helen Jensen, Arlington Heights' only public health official, visited the Janus household and discovered a Tylenol bottle with an accompanying receipt indicating it had been purchased the same day. Noticing that there were six pills missing, she turned the bottle over to investigator Nick Pichos and reported her suspicion that it was related to the Genesis deaths. Pichos called Dr. Edmund Donahue, deputy chief medical examiner for Cook County, who, suspecting that cyanide may be the culprit, asked Pichos to smell the bottle. When Pichos smelled an almond-like scent, Donahue asked the county's chief toxicologist, Michael Schaffer, to test the capsules, and Schaffer's team determined that each of the remaining 44 capsules from the Genesis bottle contained contained nearly three times the fatal amount of cyanide. Authorities held a press conference advising the public not to take Tylenol for the time being. The tainted capsules were found to have been manufactured at two different locations, Pennsylvania and Texas, suggesting that the capsules were tampered with after the product had been placed on store shelves for sale. The police hypothesis was that someone had taken bottles off shelves in local stores of the Chicago area, placed potassium cyanide in some of the capsules, and then placed the packages back on the store shelves to be purchased by unknowing customers. In addition to the five bottles that led to the victim's deaths. A few other contaminated bottles were later discovered in the Chicago area. During the initial investigations, a man named James William Lewis was accused of sending a letter to Johnson & Johnson demanding $1 million to stop the cyanide-induced murders. Upon his arrest, Lewis told authorities how the person behind the attacks may have carried out the killings by buying Tylenol, adding cyanide to the bottles, and returning them to the store shelves. Lewis denied being responsible for the poisonings, but he admitted to writing the letter, which he said he had worked on for three days. Lewis was convicted of extortion and sentenced to 10 years in prison. In January 2010, both Lewis and his wife submitted DNA samples and fingerprints to authorities. Lewis said if the FBI plays it fair, I have nothing to worry about. DNA samples did not match any DNA recovered on the bottles. Lewis continued to deny responsibility for the poisonings. Lewis died on July 9, 2023, at age 76. Police also investigated a second man, Roger Arnold, bar owner Marty Sinclair, whose establishment Arnold frequented, reported Arnold to the police, saying that Arnold had discussed killing people with a white powder and had become increasingly erratic after his marriage had dissolved. Arnold had worked with victim Mary Reiner's father at a warehouse, and Arnold's wife had been treated at a hospital across the street from the store in which Reiner bought her cyanide lace pills. A copy of the poor man's James Bond, which contained instructions on making potassium cyanide, was found in Arnold's home. Arnold was held several times by the police, but never charged. In the summer of 1983, Arnold, mistaking John Stanisha for Sinclair, 
shot and killed Stanisha, a computer consultant and father of three who was leaving a bar with multiple friends. Arnold was convicted of the killing in January 1984 and served 15 years of his 30-year sentence for second-degree murder, saying in 1996 from prison, I killed a man, a perfectly innocent person. I had choices. I could have walked away. He died in June 2008. In 2010, Arnold's body was exhumed and subsequently reburied so that his femur bone could be removed for DNA testing. Arnold's DNA did not match the DNA samples discovered on the bottles. Ketty Murders the Ketty murders are an unsolved quadruple homicide that occurred over the night of April 11th to 12th, 1981 in Ketty, California, United States. The victims were Glenna Susan Sue Sharp, daughter Tina Louise Sharp, son John Stephen Sharp, and John's friend Dana Hall Wingate. The murders took place in cabin number 28 of the Ketty Resort. The bodies of Wingate and Sue and John Sharp were found on the morning of April 12th by Sue's 14-year-old daughter Sheila, who'd been sleeping at a friend's house. Sue's two younger sons, Rick and Greg, as well as their friend Justin Smart, were also in the house but were unharmed. Tina was missing from the scene. Tina remained a missing person until April 1984, when her skull and several other bones were recovered at Camp 18 near Feather Falls in Butte County. Multiple leads and suspects were examined in the intervening years, but no charges were filed. Several new leads were announced in the 21st century, including the discovery of a hammer in a pond in 2016 and the discovery of new DNA evidence. At approximately 8 a.m. on the morning of April 12th, Sheila returned to cabin number 28 and discovered the dead bodies of Sue, John, and Dana in the house's living room. All three had been bound with medical tape and electrical cords. Tina was absent from the home, while the three younger children, Rick, Greg, and Justin, were found physically unharmed in an adjacent bedroom. Initial reports stated that the three young boys had slept through the incident, although this was later contradicted. Upon discovering the scene, Sheila rushed back to the Seabolt's house, and Jamie Seabolt retrieved Rick, Greg, and Justin through the bedroom window. He later admitted to having briefly entered the home through the back door to see if anyone was still alive, potentially contaminating evidence in the process. The murders of Sue, John, and Dana were especially vicious. Two bloodied knives and one hammer were found at the scene, and one of the knives, a steak knife later determined to have been used in the murders, had been bent at roughly 30 degrees. Blood spatter evidence from inside the house indicated that the murders had all taken place in the living room. Sue was discovered lying on her side near the living room sofa from the waist down and gagged with a blue bandana and her own underwear, which had been secured with tape. She had been stabbed in the chest, and her throat was stabbed horizontally, the wound passing through her larynx and nicking her spine, and on the side of her head was an imprint matching the butt of a Daisy 880 Powerline BB pellet rifle. John's throat was slashed. Dana had multiple head injuries and had been manually strangled to death. John and Dana suffered blunt force trauma to their heads caused by one or more hammers. Autopsies determined that Sue and John died from the knife wounds and blunt forced trauma and Dana died by asphyxiation. The cabin in which the murders occurred was demolished in 2004. In a 2008 documentary on the murders, Marilyn Smart claimed that she suspected her husband Martin and his friend, John Bo Bubede, were responsible for the murders. Marilyn claimed that on the evening of April 11, 1981, she had left Martin and Bubede at a local bar around 11 p.m. and returned home to sleep. She stated that she had awoken at approximately 2 a.m. on April 12 to find the two men burning an unknown item in the wood stove. Additionally, she alleged that Martin hated Johnny Sharp with a passion. However, in the 2008 documentary, Sheriff Doug Thomas said that he had interviewed Martin, who passed a polygraph examination. Martin Smart died of cancer in Portland, Oregon in June 2000. Booby, who allegedly had ties to organized crime in Chicago, died there in 1988. On March 24, 2016, a hammer matching the description of that which that Martin had claimed to have lost was discovered in a local pond and taken into evidence by Plumas County Special Investigator Mike Gamberg. Plumas County Sheriff Hagwood, who was 16 years old at the time of the murders and knew the Sharp family, stated, the location it was found, it would have been intentionally put there. It would not have been accidentally misplaced. Gamberg also stated that at that time, six potential suspects were being examined. To this day, no one has been charged in the crime. Las Cruces Bowling Alley Massacre the Las Cruces Bowling Alley Massacre occurred in Las Cruces, New Mexico, United States. On February 10, 1990, seven people were shot, five fatally, by two unidentified robbers at the Las Cruces Bowling Alley at 12-1 East Amador Avenue. The gunman shot the victims in an office, then set fire to a desk in the room and left the scene. The case is unsolved. On the morning of February 10, 1990, the bowling alley's manager, 34-year-old Stephanie C. Senek, was in her office preparing to open the business with her 12-year-old daughter Melissa Repass. And Melissa 
Lewis's 13-year-old friend Amy Hauser, who were planning to supervise the alley's daycare. The alley's cook, Ida Holguin, was in the kitchen when two men entered through an unlocked door. One pulled a 22 caliber pistol on Holguin and ordered her into Senek's office, where she, Repass, and Hauser were already being held by the other gunmen. The gunmen ordered the women and children to lie down, while taking approximately $4,000 to $5,000 from the bowling alley's safe. Soon after, Steve Terran, the alley's 26-year-old pin mechanic, entered. As Terran had been unable to find a babysitter for his two daughters, two-year-old Valerie Terran and six-year-old Paula Holgun, no relation to Ida, he intended to drop them off at the alley's daycare. Not seeing anyone in the alley, Terran entered Sinek's office and stumbled onto the crime scene. The gunmen then shot all seven victims multiple times at point-blank range. They then set the office on fire by igniting some papers before leaving the alley. The bowling alley fire was reported at 8.33 a.m. Officers responding to the call discovered that Amy Hauser, Paula Holguin, and Stephen Terran had died at the scene. Valerie Terran was rushed to a hospital but declared dead on arrival. Repass, despite being shot five times, called 911 on the office phone, allowing emergency services to respond immediately and saving her life along with her mother's and Ida Holguin's. However, Sinak died in 1999 due to complications from her injuries. The case remains unsolved, but is still under active investigation by the Las Cruces Police Department as of 2015. In 2016, 26 years after the shooting, a brother of victim Stephen Terran, who died in the shooting, Anthony Terran, was included in an issue of the Las Cruces Sun News newspaper, and one of his remarks was noted, in this day and age, things like this don't go unsolved. How did we not get these guys? That's the question I ask myself every day. Numerous people saw these gunmen, so someone out there knows something, and they need to come forward. Authorities are now trying to build a DNA profile from evidence found at the scene. Upstairs Lounge Arson Attack the Upstairs Lounge arson attack, sometimes called the Upstairs Lounge Fire, occurred on June 24, 1973, at a gay bar called the Upstairs or Upstairs Lounge, located on the second floor of the three-story building at 604 Iberville Street in New Orleans, Louisiana, in the United States. 32 people died and 15 were injured as a result of fire or smoke inhalation. The official cause is still listed as undetermined origin. The primary suspect, a gay man with a history of psychiatric impairment named Roger Dale Nunez, who had been ejected from the bar earlier in the day, was never charged and killed himself in November 1974 until the 2016 Orlando nightclub shooting in which 49 people were murdered. The upstairs lounge arson attack was the deadliest attack on a gay club in U.S. history. On June 24, 1973, the regular beer bus drink special attracted its usual blue-collar gay crowd to the upstairs lounge. That night's beer bust, from 5 to 7 p.m., attracted approximately 110 patrons. After the drink special ended, about 60 to 90 patrons remained at 7.56 p.m. A buzzer from downstairs sounded, and bartender Buddy Rasmussen, an Air Force veteran, asked Luther Boggs to answer the door. Anticipating a taxicab driver, Boggs opened the door to find the front staircase engulfed in flames, along with the smell of lighter fluid. Despite the fact that there were safety bars on the windows with a 14-inch gap between them to prevent dancers from breaking through the glass, Several people managed to squeeze through, some still burning when they reached the ground below. Luther Boggs was one who came through the window in flames after pushing his female friend through the gap. The flames on Boggs were extinguished by the owner of a neighboring bar, but he died on the 10th of July, 16 days later, from third-degree burns to 50% of his body. 28 people died at the scene of the 16-minute fire, and one died en route to the hospital. Another 18 suffered injuries, of whom three, including Boggs, died. The official investigation failed to yield any convictions. The only suspect in the attack attack was Roger Dale Nunez, who had been ejected from the bar earlier in the evening after fighting with another customer. Police attempted to question Nunez shortly after, but he was hospitalized with a broken jaw and could not respond. When questioned later, police records show he did not appear nervous. Nunez had a witness who claimed that he had been in and out of the bar 20 minutes before the fire and that he had seen nobody enter or leave the building. Because police observed that the witness was stressed, they dismissed the witness as a liar. Nunez was diagnosed with conversion hysteria in 1970 and visited numerous psychiatric clinics. He was released from a treatment facility in the year before the fire. After his arrest, Nunez escaped from psychiatric custody and was never picked up again by police. Despite frequent appearances in the French Quarter, a friend later told investigators that Nunez confessed on at least four occasions to starting the fire. He told the friend he squirted the bottom steps with Ronsonol lighter fluid, bought at a local Walgreens, and tossed a match. He did not realize, he claimed, that the whole place would go up in flames. Nunez killed himself in November 1974. In 1980, the state fire marshal's office, lacking leads, closed the case. Colonial Parkway Murders 
The Colonial Parkway murders were the murders of at least eight people along the Colonial Parkway in Southeast Virginia between 1986 and 1989. The Colonial Parkway is a 22-mile-long thoroughfare that cuts through the Colonial National Historical Park and connects Jamestown, Williamsburg, and Yorktown. Long stretches of the road are devoid of street lamps or road lights and are extremely isolated, making it a popular lover's lane location frequented by many young adults. In each incident, a young couple sitting in a vehicle was targeted, and both were killed. Three pairs of victims were recovered, and another couple remains missing and presumed murdered. Several other additional homicides have also been tentatively linked to the four confirmed cases. The causes of death included strangulation, gunshot, and stabbings. There was no evidence of burglary or in any of the cases. The killer drove his victims' vehicles away from the murder sites. The linking of the four crimes is circumstantial, and no suspects have ever been publicly identified. I-70 Killer the I-70 killer is an unidentified American serial killer who is known to have killed six store clerks in the Midwest. In the spring of 1992, his nickname derives from the fact that several of the stores in which his victims worked were located a few miles off of Interstate 70. His victims were usually young, petite, brunette women. One of the victims was a man, but it is believed that the killer may have expected a woman in the store due to the store having a woman's name. All of the stores attacked were specialty stores and were usually only robbed of small amounts of cash. He's also suspected of shooting three more store clerks in Texas during 1993 and 1994, one of whom survived, as well as a 2001 murder of a store clerk in Terre Haute, Indiana. Despite the case being featured on Unsolved Mysteries, America's Most Wanted, Dark Minds, and People Magazine investigates, the killer is yet to be identified, and investigators have not publicly identified any suspects. The killing spree began on April 8, 1992, with the murder of 26-year-old Payless shoe source manager, Robin Fuldauer in Indianapolis. She was alone in the store when she was shot, having been murdered sometime Time around 1.30 p.m. Her body was discovered in a storage room in the back of the store around 3 p.m. Less than $100, about $217 in 2023, had been stolen from the cash register. The next two murders occurred on April 11th at the Elibride de Elegance Bridal Shop in Wichita. The victims were Patricia Smith, 23, and the store's owner, 32-year-old Patricia Majors. As this was the only case involving multiple victims, investigators believed the killer was under the impression that there was only one woman in the store. The women had stayed past the normal closing time of 6 p.m. to allow a male customer to pick up a cummerbund. Sometime after 6 p.m., the women allowed the killer into the store, thinking he was the customer they were waiting for. After the women were murdered, the actual customer arrived to pick up the cummerbund and came face to face with the I-70 killer. The customer noticed that the killer had a gun, and the killer asked the customer to come with him to the back of the store. The customer refused, after which the killer told him to leave the scene. Had the customer cooperated with the killer, he almost certainly would have been murdered as well. The customer was so frightened that he did not report the incident until more than an hour had passed. He later provided details for a composite sketch of the killer, describing the killer as a slender white man with reddish hair armed with an Uzi-style gun. On April 27th, Michael McCown, 40, was killed in his mother Sylvia's ceramics store in Terre Haute, Indiana, around 4 p.m. MC Cowan's wallet and less than $50, about $109 in 2023, were stolen from the store. No witnesses reported seeing the killer beforehand. McCown was the only man killed during the spree, and it is believed by investigators that the I-70 killer chose the store because the store's name, Sylvia Ceramics, seemed to make it a good target because McCown was reported to wear his hair in a ponytail and was shot from behind. While he was kneeling to stock shelves, he may have been mistaken for a woman. On May 3rd, 24-year-old Nancy Kitzmiller was killed while working alone at Boot Village, a footwear shop in St. Charles, Missouri. She opened up the shop at noon and was found dead by customers at 2.30 p.m. She had been shot in the back of the head. She was supposed to be off that day. However, she agreed to come in so that a co-worker could have the day off. Some money was taken from the cash register. Although no one heard the shot, a witness did see her with her final customer just minutes before her death, and this sighting helped police to create a composite drawing. The final confirmed murder occurred on May 7th in Raytown, Missouri. The victim was 37-year-old Sarah Blessing, who was working in her gift shop, store of many colors. The murder occurred during the day, and the owner of the video store next to Blessing's shop saw the killer enter the shop, heard a pop, and then saw him leave. He discovered Blessing's body after checking to see what had occurred in the store. A clerk at a nearby grocery store also also saw the suspect. He was climbing a hill towards I-70. The murders were conclusively linked after a St. Charles detective suspected a connection. All of the murders were committed with a 22 caliber firearm, and the victims were usually petite, young women with long dark hair. Aside from the Wichita murders, all the victims were alone. All were shot in the back of the head. None of the scenes had any signs of
and while all stores were robbed, robbery appeared to be a secondary motive as all the stores were small specialty businesses which did not have much money. The murders took place at slow times of day when the stores were deserted, such as after lunch or around closing time. Several of them were in strip malls near I-70. Based on witness testimonies, police strongly believe the murder weapon may have been an Intratec Scorpion pistol or an Irma Work 22 pistol. They have not, however, been able to rule out any other 22 caliber firearm models. Midwest authorities linked the killer to the shootings in Texas in 1994, but Texas authorities were not convinced of a connection as different guns were used in each spree. Based on witness descriptions, investigators were able to produce two composite sketches of the killer and a physical description of the suspect. The I-70 killer was described as being a white man in his 20s or 30s, 5 foot 7 inches to 5 foot 9 inches tall, thin, and having lazy eyelids and sandy blonde or reddish hair in 1992. In 2021, the St. Charles Police Department published age-progressed versions of the original composite sketch to show what the killer may look like today. Investigators believe the killer is between 52 and 70 years old if he is still alive. Police have not publicly identified any suspects, and the case has been classified as a cold case. West Mesa Murders the West Mesa murders are the killings of 11 women whose remains were found buried in 2009 in the desert on the West Mesa of Albuquerque, New Mexico, United States. Several suspects have been named, but none were arrested or charged. While the killings were initially believed to be the work of a serial killer, the involvement of a trafficking ring has been suspected. An anonymous tip to authorities at APD and FBI linked the murders to a suspect from Central America. Police have also suspected the involvement of a trafficking ring operating through neighboring Texas that targets prostitutes during events throughout the Southwest, Southern, and Western United States, especially regularly scheduled events such as the New Mexico State Fair in this case, to take advantage of reliably heavier traffic. This small fragment of a human trafficking ring involves numerous population centers, including Las Vegas in Nevada, El Paso in Killeen in Texas, and Denver in Colorado. Between 2001 and 2005, 11 women were buried by an unknown assailant in an Arroyo Bank on Albuquerque's West Mesa in an undeveloped area within city limits. Satellite imagery taken between 2003 and 2005 shows tire marks and patches of disturbed soils in the area where the remains were recovered. By 2006, development had encroached on the area, and soon after, the site was disturbed buried and platted for residential development. Due to the 2008 housing bubble collapse, development on the west side halted before housing could be built at the burial site. After neighbors complained of flooding at the platted site, due to the burial of the natural arroyo, the developer built a retaining wall to channel stormwater to a retention pond, built in the approximate area of the burial site, inadvertently exposing bones to the surface. On February 2, 2009, a woman walking a dog found a human bone on the West Mesa and reported it to police. As a result of the subsequent police investigation, Authorities discovered the remains of 11 women and girls and a fetus buried in the area. They were between 15 and 32 years of age. Most were Hispanic and most were involved with drugs and work. The remains discovered in 2009 were identified as those of the following women and girls, all of whom disappeared between 2001 and 2005. Jamie Barilla, 15, Monica Candelaria, 22, Victoria Chavez, 26, Virginia Cloven, 24, Celania Edwards, 15, Cinnamon Elks, 32, Doreen Marquez, 24, Julie Nieto, 24, Veronica Romero, 28, Evelyn Salazar, 27, Michelle Valdez, 22, According to satellite photos, the last victim was buried in 2005. Police suspect that the bodies were all buried by the same person or persons and may be the work of a serial killer who has since come to be referred to as the West Mesa Bone Collector. No official suspects have ever been named in connection with the murders. In 2010s, a reward of up to $100,000 was being offered for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or persons responsible. Over time, a number of men have attracted police attention, though not named as full suspects, in connection with the murders. Fred Reynolds was a pimp who knew one of the missing women and reportedly had photos of missing workers. He died of natural causes in January 2009. Lorenzo Montoya lived less than three miles from the burial site. In 2006, there were reportedly dirt trails leading from his trailer park to the site. He had twice been arrested for violent attacks on workers and had threatened to kill his girlfriend and bury her in Lyme. Co-workers said he had talked about killing women and burying them on the West Mesa. In December 2006, Montoya strangled a teenage 
worker to death at his trailer and then was shot to death by the teen's boyfriend. It would appear the killing stopped after his death. In August 2010, police searched several properties in Joplin, Missouri associated with local photographer and businessman Ron Irwin in connection with the West Mesa cases. They confiscated tens of thousands of photos from the man who reportedly used to visit the state fair in Albuquerque. Police confirmed that they had cleared Irwin as a suspect. In December 2010, convicted Colorado serial killer Scott Lee Kimball stated that he was being investigated for the West Mesa murders, but he did denied killing the women. In 2014, a breakthrough on a decades-old case caused Albuquerque police to become interested in Joseph Blee as a suspect for the murders. Blee has been dubbed the mid-school rape for his activities in the 1980s. Blee had women's underwear and jewelry not belonging to his wife or daughter in his home and allegedly told a cellmate that he had hired the West Mesa victims who he called Trashy Blee in the mid-school case was sentenced to 36 years in June 2015 at 58 years of age. The Doodler the Doodler is an unidentified serial killer believed responsible for between 6 and 16 murders and three assaults of men in San Francisco, California between January 1974 and September 1975. The nickname was given due to the perpetrator's habit of sketching his victims prior to stabbing them to death. The perpetrator met his victims at gay nightclubs, bars, and restaurants. The suspect was described as a black man between 19 and 25 years of age. He was about 6 feet tall with a slender build. Several victims were stabbed in the front and back of their bodies in similar locations. All of the victims were white males. Police theorized that the victims had all died after meeting with the suspect near the locations where their bodies were recovered. At 1.57 a.m. on January 27, 1974, a corpse was found at the water's edge on San Francisco's Ocean Beach. Gerald Earl Kavanaugh, 49, a Canadian-American immigrant, had been stabbed multiple times. Kavanaugh's fully clothed body was located lying face up. He had died hours before. He was determined to have been conscious at the time he was killed and had attempted to resist his killer because he had self-defense wounds. He initially remained unidentified, being temporarily known as John Doe No. 7 by the medical examiner. Joseph J. Stevens, 27, was discovered on June 25, 1974. Klaus Hakim Klaus Kreisman, 31, was discovered by a woman walking her dog on July 7, 1974. In January 2022, the San Francisco police identified another victim, 52-year-old Warren Andrews, April 27, 1975. Andrews was found unconscious, but never regained consciousness, dying seven weeks later. Frederick Elmer Capen, 32, was discovered on May 12, 1975, in San Francisco. Harold Goldberg, 66, was discovered on June 4, 1975, in a decomposed state about two weeks after his death in Lincoln Park. He remained slightly inconsistent with the other homicides because he was far older than the others. His underwear had been taken by his killer, and his pants were unzipped. However, Goldberg is believed to have been the final confirmed victim of the doodler. While he remained unidentified, he was known as John Doe No. 81. Police questioned a young man as a murder suspect in the case, but could not proceed with criminal charges because the three surviving victims did not want to out themselves by testifying against him in court. Among the stabbing survivors were a well-known entertainer and a diplomat. The suspect cooperated with police during his interview, but he never admitted guilt for the murders and attacks. Officers stated that they strongly believed that the man in question was responsible for the crimes, but he was never tried or convicted because of the survivors' refusals to appear in court. To date, the suspect has not been named publicly or apprehended. Very little information is available to the public about the crimes. The case is open and ongoing in the San Francisco Police Department. Recent successes using DNA technology developed in the decades since the crimes have led police to re-examine evidence in the case. In February 2019, police offered a $100,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of the killer and released a revised sketch showing what he could look like four decades later. They later announced they would consider forensic genetic genealogy, which identified a suspect in the Golden State Killer murders. To date, no one has been charged. Frog Boys the Frog Boys were a group of five boys who disappeared in Daegu, South Korea on March 26, 1991. Woo Chil Won, Jo Ho Yeon, Kim Young Ju, Park Chan In, and Kim Jong Sik aged between 9 and 13 years old, disappeared after searching for salamander eggs in the western outskirts of Daegu on a public holiday. Their disappearance received widespread attention and caused a national media frenzy, and President R.H. Tae-woo ordered a massive manhunt by the police and military to find them. On September 26, 2002, the remains of the boys were discovered near where they went egg searching, with some showing signs of blunt force trauma. The investigation has been inconclusive, and theories abound about their deaths. The case remains unsolved. Hinterkaifeck murders
The Hinterkaifeck murders occurred on the evening of March 31, 1922, when six inhabitants of a small Bavarian farmstead, located approximately 43 miles north of Munich, Germany, were murdered by an unknown assailant. The six victims were Andreas Gruber, aged 63, his wife Celia Gruber, aged 72, their widowed daughter Victoria Gabriel, aged 35, Victoria's children Zelia, aged 7, and Josef, aged 2, and the maid Maria Baumgartner, aged 44. They were all found struck dead with a mattock, also known as a grub axe. The perpetrator lived with the six corpses of their victims for three days. The murders are considered one of the most gruesome and puzzling unsolved crimes in German history. Four of the dead bodies were found stacked up in the barn, the victims having been lured there one by one. Prior to the incident, the family and their former maid reported hearing strange noises coming from the attic, which led to that maid leaving. The case remains unsolved to this day. On the afternoon of Friday 31st, March 1922, the new maid, Maria Baumgartner, arrived at the farm. Maria's sister had escorted her there and left the farm after a short stay. She was most likely the last person to see the inhabitants alive. It appears that in the late evening, Victoria Gabriel, her seven-year-old daughter Zelia, and her parents Andreas and Celia were lured to the family barn through the stable, where they were murdered. One at a time, the perpetrator used a mattock belonging to the family farm and killed the family with blows to the head. The perpetrator then moved into the living quarters where, with the same murder weapon, they killed Joseph, sleeping in his bassinet, and Baumgartner in her bedchamber, Inspector Georg Reingruber and his department investigated the killings. Initial investigations were hampered by the number of people who had interacted with the crime scene, moved bodies and items around, and even cooked and eaten meals in the kitchen. The day after the discovery of the bodies, court physician Johann Baptist Omler performed autopsies in the barn. It was established that a mattock was the most likely murder weapon, although the weapon itself was not found at the scene. Evidence showed that the younger Zelia had been alive for several hours after the assault. She had torn her hair out in tufts while lying in the straw. The skulls of the victims were removed and sent to Munich for further examination. First suspecting the motive to be robbery, the police interrogated traveling craftsmen, vagrants, and several inhabitants from the surrounding villages. But they abandoned this theory. When a large amount of money was found in the house, it was clear that the perpetrator had remained at the farm for several days. Someone had fed the cattle, consumed the entire supply of bread from the kitchen, and had recently cut meat from the pantry. With no clear motive to be gleaned from the crime scene, the police began to formulate a list of suspects. Despite repeated arrests, no murderer has ever been found, and the files were closed in 19 55. The last interrogations took place in 1986, before Detective Chief Superintendent Conrad Muller retired. Author Bill James, in his book The Man from the Train, alleges that a man known as Paul Muller, a German migrant, may have been responsible for the murders. Muller was the only suspect in the 1898 murder of a Massachusetts family, and James believes Muller killed dozens of victims based on research in American newspaper archives. The Hinterkaifeck murders bear some similarities to Muller's suspected crimes in the United States, including the slaughter of an entire family in their isolated home, use of the blunt edge of a farm tool as a weapon, moving and stacking bodies of the victims, and the apparent absence of robbery as a motive. James suspects that Muller, described as a German immigrant in contemporary media, M, might have departed the U.S. for his homeland by 1912 after private investigators and journalists noticed and publicized patterns in family murders across state lines. The authors rate the chances of Muller as the Hinterkaifeck killer as more or less a toss-up, but conclude there's no real reason to believe that it's not him. And with that, it concludes the second layer of this iceberg. Now, the further we go down this rabbit hole of serial killers, the videos will get longer as there are more entries in each layer. So what I can do is make the segment of each smaller with just a summary, or we can just have long videos like this one. Either way, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that bell to know when I upload the next layer. And also comment what you guys would like to see in the future. Also check out my other videos. And always remember, stay curious and keep exploring, even in the hidden corners of the happiest places on earth.